gives me pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Professor Freud has been recognized worldwide as an engineering education pioneer and his achievements in various areas included, including integrated curriculum development and evaluation, adoption, institutionalization, and propagation of edu educational innovations, curriculum redesign, and uh, faculty development in optical sensing for diagnostics and biomedical monitoring applications are well known. He has served as a project director for National Science Foundation, Engineering Education Coalition. He has offered over 30 workshops of faculty development, curricular change process, curriculum redesign, assessment uh, and assessment in US and abroad. In particular, Professor Fried has been mentoring uh, teaching and learning center at IIT Madras from 2009. So he's a regular visitor every year. He has been visiting IIT Madras Teaching Learning Center and uh, conducting workshops, guiding faculty, guiding the center. Before joining the Department of Engineering uh, Education of Ohio State University, uh, he spent 18 years uh, at Texas A&M University, uh, most recently as a research professor in Office of Engineering, Academic and Student Affairs. Previously, he was a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at Rose Hulman. There he co-authored the integrated first year curriculum in science, engineering and mathematics, which was recognized in 1997 as a Hesburgh Award Certificate of Excellence. Was a, for Freud is a fellow of Institute of Electrical and Electronic IEEE, Electric, uh, Electronics Engineers, and American Society for Engineering Education. He is currently the editor-in-chief of IEEE Transactions on Education. So before I uh, hand over, we hand over to Professor Freud, I'll request uh, Professor Kakkar to uh, greet him with a bouquet. <laughs> and uh, hand over a small memento. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for being willing to invest um, some of your time in the workshop. Um, first of all, uh, this morning's session uh, has been revised over a number of years, and uh, there are a lot of people who com contributed to its development, so I want to recognize those people uh, and not give you the sense that this was just created by me. Uh, but there have been a number of people that have helped contribute to this uh, workshop. Uh, I have been working in faculty development for a number of years, and a typical question that people ask a faculty developer, they're very concerned with how to teach. They're very concerned with what they do in the classroom. And so you'll get a question like this. What is a better way to teach? Should I write the notes on a blackboard or a whiteboard, depending on the thing? Or should I show notes in a PowerPoint? The problem is, is that the, even though the people are very sincere about posing the question, it's not a well-posed question. What's missing is the intent. So while it says, what's a better way, what's a better way to what? What do you want to get? It's something like asking, I want to build a bridge. What should I build the bridge out of? Most civil engineers will say, well, where are you going to put the bridge? What's the span of it? How many people is it going to carry? How many trucks is it going to carry? How many cars is it going to carry? I can't answer the question about what to build the bridge out of until you tell me a lot more detail about the intent of the bridge. In the same way, I can't answer this question, and you shouldn't be able to answer this question, without clear picture of the intent of what you're trying to achieve with your teaching. Teaching is not a goal. It's often presented as something that says, I want to know how to teach. You don't teach to do something. Teaching is a way to achieve something. And so you need to be clear about what uh, we're going to, what you're trying to achieve via teaching. Teaching ultimately designs a learning environment to achieve some goals. So while the learning environment needs to be conducive to learning, 
you need to be clear about the goals that we're trying to teach, that we're trying to achieve via teaching. So that's what we're going to do, and I was going to skip to here. So here's the plan for the next two days. We're going to work on uh, course learning outcomes this morning. Um, we're going to work on assessment this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to need to adjust your ideas about assessment. Uh, but the whole first day is going to be about teaching. But for many of you, you may be slightly disappointed. Because many faculty, when they come to a workshop on teaching, they expect, to, they expect and say, please tell me something I can do in the classroom that will intrigue the interest of my student, that will promote learning, that will get them motivated, that will accomplish miracles. Please tell me some little thing that I can do in the classroom that will change everything. And most of us who have been teaching for several years realize that the major part of teaching does not occur in the classroom despite the public's view of the classroom, and despite many faculty's questions when they ask about teaching, most teaching occurs long before the teacher arrives in the classroom. And that's what we're going to spend the first day on. So we need to be clear about what we're trying to achieve via our teaching before we decide how to teach. And so we're going to spend most of today talking about what we want to achieve our teaching and how to be clear about that. Because in most cases, the language we use for our goals is often ambiguous and unhelpful. So tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we'll actually begin to talk about what happens in the classroom. And I will try to address at that point uh, questions about what happens in a classroom with large enrollment versus what happens in a classroom with small enrollment. Okay. But today's thing applies to classrooms of all sizes because it's about being clear in your intent. So, there are some goals for, the, there are some ground rules for the workshop. Okay. The, the goal of the workshop is participant learning. Okay. The goal of the workshop is that you walk out of the workshop with something more, something that you can use something that you can apply, something that you can put to work. The goal is not to listen to me talk, because that doesn't really change the way what you do. Now, for that reason, um, the purpose of the workshop is to not cover content. If you wanted to cover the content of this morning's workshop, we can do that in approximately 30 seconds. It will look like this. So, at this point, I've covered about a third of the content of the workshop, and I'm sure you have absorbed a tremendous amount through that content coverage. And that's one of the problems with the metaphor we use to describe teaching. When we describe teaching as content coverage, then that's content coverage. Some people would say, well, no, you need to cover the content slower. Okay. I'm not sure that that does much better, but that's still covering the content. So the purpose of this is your learning. Now, I have a really awful gauge of your learning. Let me pose it another way. I have done a number of workshops, and I can guarantee you that I'm an awful anticipator of your questions. I do not understand what your questions are. I do not understand what questions may arise as we're doing the workshop. I do not understand them at all. Okay, So I'm just lousy at it. Now, let me take that as a drawback, but I'm lousy at it. On the other hand, I think I have demonstrated, now you may disagree uh, tomorrow after approximately two days worth of evidence, but people have told me over the years that I'm not too bad at answering people's questions. So I can not anticipate your questions, but I can do a much better job of answering the questions than I can anticipating that. For that reason, when you have a question, please try to ask. There will be no assigned period in the workshop where, oh, questions have been postponed and now it's question time. Okay. So if you have a question, please ask. Now, I may ask you to say, well, wait a minute, we're going to get that question in a couple slides, and hopefully you will at that point be patient. But please, when you have a question, let's go ahead and ask, because I can cover the content of the slides, as you've seen, and we can be out of here in another five minutes if you'd like. 
Now, I've no, I haven't noticed anybody today, and that's partly because the slides that have been presented this far have not been noteworthy. Some people attempt to take pictures of slides. I don't discourage pic taking pictures of slides. You're more than welcome to. However, I'm happy to make a copy of the PowerPoint presentation available to uh, Dr. I've never said her last name. That what they just said. <laughs> and if you want a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, then you write her. And if you've been nice to her, that she may send you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. But that's entirely out of my guard. We'll make sure that she has a copy and that she can decide whether you, your attendance and participation in the workshop justifies sending you a PowerPoint version. But uh, you do not need to take a copy of, down of the information because we'll try to make that available to you. That's the plan for the next two days. There are very many pictures of how to organize your teaching, and this gives you some idea of one approach. In the upper right, we're going to start here. We need to answer the question, what do we want our students to be able to do at the end of the course? Oftentimes, we phrase it in terms of what we're going to do instead of what they're going to walk away with. But we're going to try to shift the emphasis to what the students are going to be expected to be able to do at the end of the course. And then I find that even stating that doesn't quite go far enough because then we have to think, well, if this is what I want my students to be able to do, what am I going to look at? to figure out what they should do. So, for example, engineers are often called to design. Okay, let's suppose that I want my, I want to be able to design a wireless communication network. That's the goal of the course. Students should be able to design a wireless communication network. Well, what are you going to look at to figure out whether they can do that? Sometimes we say, well, we're going to, we're going to ask them to submit a report. So they're going to turn in a nice set of people, paper documents. But if your goal was to say, I want them to be able to design a wireless communication network, then somehow you would expect to see from that goal a wireless communication network being erected and they're being designed. Now, on the other hand, if the goal was that they would send in a report on a wireless communication network, that's an entirely different question. So we need to also consider what sort of evidence we'll look at. Once we are clear about what we want the <laughs> students to do and what kind of evidence we're going to collect with respect to their achievement of those goals, then we're in a better position to talk about what we're actually going to do in the classroom. And then finally, at the end of that, we conduct the class, we look at the evidence, and we can make some decision about how well the students met our achieved outcomes or not. Based on that, we're going to teach the course again, usually, and so we'll make some changes and go back and repeat the cycle. So that's the plan. We're going to start here. So uh, I realize, yes, sir? Excuse me? Yes, that's right. Is it important that you read the things on the violet things? Not at the moment. So we'll get into more depth so that'll clear that up. So I think, as I understand it, you are in the middle of a term. Is that correct? Okay. Beginning, beginning. beginning of a term. First month. Hmm? First month. So you've been teaching for a while in this thing. Okay. Three. Debate with your colleagues about where you are in the course. I'm not going to. So, when I th ask you to think of a course, don't think of the course that you're teaching now. Because it's often too late to do anything about that. I want you to think of the course that you'll be teaching next term. So I want you to think of a course that you'll be teaching next term, and I want you to write down. Now, when I say write, I, I don't know the tradition in Mabe. I don't know the tradition of this institute. In the United States, when we use the word write, that means that somebody actually picks up a pen or a pencil, and they pick, have a piece of paper, and they scroll the pen across the piece of paper. Marks are left on the piece of paper with concrete evidence that something has occurred. So I want you to write a learning outcome for a course that you will be teaching next semester. Can be one line or... Uh, can be, it, you can fill a page. I just want you to know, you have a learning outcome for the course.
We're going to talk, uh, actually this morning on learning outcomes, we're going to talk in two parts. Uh, we're going to work a lot on the purpose of learning outcomes and resources for doing that. And then in the second part of this morning, we're going to talk about effectively using learning outcomes once you've written them. So, but for the course that you're going to teach next semester, you have begun the most, what I consider to be the most important work of the course. And that is deciding what your goal, what the learning outcome, one of the learning outcomes for the course is. Faculty members all over the world talk about how much content there is to be covered. Faculty all over the world will say, I don't have enough time to cover the content in my course. And my answer to that has increasingly become, you're right. However, your goal is not content coverage. We can do this. We've just covered lots of content. I'm sure it's been very exciting for you. But ultimately, what makes the difference is what the students leave your course with. And you literally have hundreds of options for what you, the students could leave your choice, course with. And you are in the position of making the choice among those hundreds of different possibilities. And your responsibility as faculty members first is to make good choices among those. So you have engaged by writing a learning outcome, you are making a choice of I'm going to concentrate on this and not concentrate on some other things. So in general, learning outcomes should answer the question, what should students know and be able to do as a consequence of your instruction? How will students be able to think or at what cognitive level perform? This is the this is the question that a learning outcome is trying to answer. And then your instruction helps support the students in their achievement of that learning outcome. So there are ground rules for learning outcomes. If this is what learning outcomes are supposed to answer, then the learning outcome should have a verb that describes an observable action. That is, I have to see some observable result from my description of a learning outcome. And it should focus on the student. It is not a question of what you do, it is what a student is able to do as a consequence of your instruction. So, with these two provisions, I'd like for you to revisit the learning outcome that you wrote down. And if the learning outcome that you wrote down doesn't meet these two rules, then I'd like to, for you to revise the learning outcome so that it in fact meets these guidelines. Yes, sir. You mean this point? Um, what are you going to, I mean, so if I say that the student is, um, supposed to be able to generate something for me, what is it that they're going to generate as a result of their thinking? Yes, sir. This applies to any course that I know of that's offered at a university. that I know of. Now, there may be some courses at a university that I don't know about, but... I was thinking of something like management principles, or the Indian thought, and then I found that I'm into trouble. So, again, when you talk about Gandhian thought, what you're talking about is content. What I'm interested in is what will the students show you that will be an indicator for both you and the student that they have, in some sense, achieved some mastery of Gandhian thought. Now, the, from my work at IIT Madras, you develop a syllabus. At, the, at IIT Madras, they develop a syllabus. And I'm often asked the question, well, what's the difference between a syllabus and a learning outcome? Syllabus tends to be focused on content, it tends to be focused on topics. It tends to be said, these will be the things that are covered. We can have a whole list of things in our course. 
It is typically noun-oriented, it is typically instruction-oriented, it is typically content-oriented. It's a way to say, we're going to cover the content. I'm suggesting that that way of thinking about the course is counterproductive for both you and the student. Instead, you should look at the what kind of learning you're expecting. It is both verb and noun-oriented, so you see uh, observable-oriented verbs. It is focused on the learning instead of the instruction, and it describes what students are going to be walking away with instead of what you will be doing. Now, there are some people in education that say learning outcomes should be measurable. I'm not against that. My background is as an electrical engineer. When you say to me, measure, that means that I have an international recognized unit and I'm going to give you quantitative numbers with respect to that internationally recognized unit. Now, typically we have not, in our work on learning, reached the point where we can generate internationally recognized units for learning. You've measured so much kinequats. We don't have that. Okay. And therefore, I think it becomes a, a little bit stretch to say that we can measure learning. Yes, sir. So the question is a little tricky because I don't know what is meant by appropriate. Can a number capture the success? And the answer is no. But, on the other hand, it can convey with suitable understanding of the, a lack of precision in the number, some indication of that. So, so for example, uh, when we grade a test and we grade it and say, is that there's a 20 point problem? And we say that you get 18 out of 20. Is that appropriate? It may not be appropriate, but it helps both you and the student to give some idea of what their performance on the thing was. Do we believe that it should be 18 instead of 19? I'm not sure. Do we believe that it should be 18 instead of 2? Yeah, I'm pretty confident it shouldn't be a 2. And, you know, should it be 18 instead of 17? Eh, I don't know about that. I mean, so with an understanding of the lack of precision in the number, if we're willing to say that the number is some kind of marker for us that has a considerable ambiguity in the thing, then it helps us, I think. It also helps in processing a large number of students, because if I were to start with a list of 200 students, I'd say, this student did good, this student did. I run out of, I run out of levels, and it's far more convenient to put some numbers to that and manipulate those numbers. So I think you're asking the question in the reverse order. You're assuming that we're going to give tests and then saying we're going to have learning outcomes. Instead, learning outcomes begin, and then we say, given this learning outcome, what is the, what is the way in which we're going to assess achievement of those learning outcomes? And it may or may not be a test. And that's why it's, the circle worked in the way it did. First decide on the learning outcome, and then we're going to look at an assessment that would be appropriate for that learning outcome. I don't know what you wrote down, and I'm not really going to look at your people, paper. But I've noticed that when I give faculty this exercise, there are a number of faculty that use words like understand. The students should understand. The students should know. The students should appreciate. Okay. Now, 
I don't want you to leave the room saying that Dr. Freud doesn't think that understanding is a good thing. I do. I think that students should understand. I'm just telling you that the word understand doesn't provide any observable action. Okay? If I say, do you understand learning outcomes? I can't come near you. I'm sensing that you do. I can't. I mean, I don't know. Now, if he wrote down a learning outcome, I could look at it and go, no, that's a terrible learning outcome. You don't. The question is whether he can write a good learning outcome. The question is not whether he understands it. So lots of faculty you want to use the word, I want them to understand. I want them to know. So those, the, the problem with those words is they are not, they don't result in observable action. You may say to the student, I want them to understand structural mechanics. Great. Both you and the student are now still confused about what's going to happen. Ultimately, you're going to give them a test or something, and you're going to ask them to do something. So the real question is, at some point, you're going to translate their understanding into some observable action. I'm saying make that a part of your learning outcome to the extent that you can, rather than use these words that help neither you nor your student. The problem with words like understand and know is that they allow a lot of ambiguity, and the ambiguity hurts both you and the student in terms of the achievement. So, in another way of thinking at it, when you're writing learning outcomes, words like understand or know are illegal. Now, they know that they should be, ah, they know that they should be doing something. So active verbs. So people put down, I will use the word demonstrate. And then I'll say, I want them to demonstrate understanding. Okay. Well, I'm telling you that that doesn't give you any more clarity than the word understand. So, no, it doesn't help. So, well, let's, I should revise the number if you want to change the class size. Think of a class with 200 people. They're all sitting there. I want you to tell me whether the, okay, our goal is to understand wireless communication. I want you to look at the room and tell me which of those 200 students understand wireless communication. You can't. Well, you say, well, I'll give them something to do. Well, what are you going to give them to do? Well, why not make that your learning outcome instead of the word understand? Both then with you and your students would have greater clarity about what is going to be aiming for. So, we want the students, you know, we certainly want them to, for example, to be able to predict responses of a system. Maybe if you're thinking of a systems-oriented class. We want them to be able to explain the responses that occur. We want them to be able to solve quantitative problems. We want them to be able to apply to novel situations. All of those words, like predict and explain and solve and apply, suggest observable results that I could look at and evaluate. They would certainly give greater clarity about your expectations than the word understand. Second. Let's suppose that this half of the class, we've been doing class for now, we're halfway through the class. Let me suppose that this half of the class doesn't understand. What are you going to do? Are you going to project understanding at them? Are you going to turn down the lights? Are you going to encourage them in breathing exercises or what? You know, the problem with the saying, I want students to understand is it gives you no clue about what you want them to be able to do to get better. Understand better. On the other hand, if I say, I want you to be able to solve this set of problems, then I could give them problems like that and they could practice and if they can solve them, good, and if they can't, great, and we got some clarity about whether they can do it or not. So the word understand doesn't give clarity to either you or the learner in terms of what they should be working on. The learner's not, if I say it's supposed to understand or know or appreciate, no, the student is not sure about what to focus on and what you're not to focus on. So, the first challenge is, when writing learning outcomes, is that faculty want, are oftentimes vague about their learning outcomes. Learning outcomes should be crystal clear. 
explicit, understandable by both you and the students at the very beginning of the course. Students should be able to look at something and say, I can either do that or I can't. If I can't do that, then that's what the course is about. I should be able to try to get there. Yes, sir? You're trying to understand? <laughs> oh, now we're in trouble. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So, when I try and kind of, you know, when I try and think about how I would write the, the learning outcome for a particular course, it looks to me like a rephrasing, a little bit of a rephrasing of what I would say the content of the course. If you said, please write on the syllabus of the course, I would say, you know, here is, <laughs> here is like a list of maybe 100 things that I want to achieve. I will, I will not get past 30. Right. And so if you said, now tell me what the learning outcomes would be, you know, when I'm trying to think about how I would do this in my mind, mm -hmm. I would say, you know, instead of saying, I want to teach you singular value decomposition, I would like the students to be able to demonstrate, you know, problem solving capacity in singular value, you know, however you, know, you phrase that. Mm -hmm. Is this, you know, is this all, you know, is this what you're, what you're talking about, is this, you know, to translate this into people? So if we take the idea of singular value decomposition, let's suppose that that's listed as a topic in our linear algebra course. Okay, singular. So the problem with the, the noun is it conveys nothing about what the students is expected to do with it. Do you expect with them, do you expect them to define a singular value decomposition? Do you expect them to be able to take a matrix and get you a singular value decomposition? Do you expect them to be able to look at a problem and um, then use the singular value decomposition to say something definitive about the characteristics of the system that is being described with the, with the matrix? Now, all of those going from define a singular value decomposition to take a matrix and get its singular value decomposition to use the singular value decomposition to say something about the characteristics of the system, each of those is a different cognitive level. So you have the challenge of given the, your course and given uh, where you are in the curriculum and given what the students, what cognitive level are you trying to get the students to? So this is a problem with the content, singular value decomposition could mean a lot of things. When you begin to write a learning outcome with singular value decomposition, you're not only saying we're going to work on that particular topic, you're going to define the cognitive level that students are expected to get to in that course. Because you have several different cognitive levels that they could work on. And I don't know for your course what the appropriate one is. And that brings us to this next challenge. Most faculty, when challenged to write, yes, sir. Design is a very acceptable verb because they're going to create something that you can then look at. Well, they're going to have to design something, right? So I, ah. So, the learning outcome could be to say design something, depending on the topic. And that's enough for the learning outcome. However, it is not enough for the evidence that you're going to look at and how you're going to evaluate that. Because, and we're going to talk, the design is a very, the effort of creating a design yields typically a very complex work product. That had, unlike saying, uh, solve a set of nodal equations, solving a set of nodal equations gets you a number. <laughs> okay, great. That's not too hard. When you design something, you're going to end up with a very complex work product, and then there are many aspects could, could be evaluated, and then you're going to come have to come up with an evaluation scheme for that complex work product. So, in the sense that design something gives you the learning outcome, but it quite accurately, as you said, doesn't describe how I'm going to evaluate that complex work product, and many people in the room could disagree looking at the same design. And so they, they could look at different things, so then you'll have to go to another level, 
and that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon. What are the things that you're going to concentrate on and what does good performance look like versus poor performance look like? Okay. Yes, sir. It's a usually a good practice, yes. I would share them at the very beginning. Okay, now that doesn't mean I won't return to them at some other points, but I would share them at the very beginning. And you'll say, well, so typically in a course, one of the things that you introduce in the course is terminology. So your, your learning outcomes will contain terms with which the student may or may not be familiar. Okay? But on the other hand, the verbs that you use are likely to be familiar to the student regardless of the terminology. So things like design, apply, predict, explain. All of those are things that the student would understand. So explain X, they may not know what X is, but all I got to know is once I know the definition of X, my challenge is to explain X. So people often assume that the big problem in the course is decoding the terminology, and that's rarely in a college level course. What the goal of the instruction is, is to just know what the terminology is. And most people can get pat once they know that they're supposed to be able to do something with this terminology I don't yet understand, then all I got to do is be able to define, to under know what the thing is, and I have a greater clarity. So with our access to knowledge, so for example, if you tell me what the term is, tell me a term that would, you think what students wouldn't know. Of course you teach. What's a term you think the students won't know initially? RTB. What's that? What's that? Resident time distribution? Yeah, well, they'll go type it into the internet and they'll go, this is what residence time distribution is. Okay, well, got that. Now, what does he want me to do with the residence time distribution? Oh, well, now I can, oh, well, can I do that with residence time distribution? Maybe not. But at least I'm kind of in a pain of being able to answer the question now, can I do that? I love people when they say, is it okay? What am I supposed to do? I, you know, I'm like, well, no, it is not okay. I'm not. Stop. 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 Stop.
So you've got to look and say when an appropriate number of learning outcomes, when you set a learning outcome, that means in my picture of things that you're going to actually give the students a crack at demonstrating it and you're going to evaluate it. And in fact, in my way of thinking, not necessarily your way of thinking, if it's a learning outcome and I do want the students to get good at it, what are they going to have to do? Practice it. Okay? So if you give 50 learning outcomes, that means there's going to be 50 different things the students are practicing throughout the semester. Really? That's one of the things that makes me wonder about the whole content. You know, we're likely, we love to list nouns. Okay, whoo, you know, noun, topic, 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 topic. Are the students going to do anything with that? I don't know, but we're going to cover it. You know, here's topic, you know. It reminds me of a comedian, you know. He would have a course in anatomy. You know, the army course in anatomy. Here's the body, look at it, memorize it. Here's the limbic system, look at it, memorize it. Here are the bones, here's the skeletal system, look at it, memorize it. Okay, we're done with that. Okay. You know, we, I can put all of those topics there and I can make them like flashcards. But that, just because you've exposed them to things. So when you come and writing down, these are things that you expect students to get good at, which means they need to have opportunities to practice them and fail perhaps and get better at. And so, I mean, how many things do you can be worked on in a course? I don't know that there's a magic number. It does, 50 seems a little large, and two seems a little small. People don't like to think that I'm going to do more in a course than accomplish two things, but, so, you know, that, there's some magic numbers, you know, for each faculty somewhere between them. And I've found that faculty are different. Some faculty are very happy with five learning outcomes. Other faculty need to be more precision, and they like 20 or, you know, learning outcomes makes them feel better that they've laid out everything. Yes, sir. This leads me to think that another approach is for a student to set the values at the end of the course. The proposed means this different thing. Not only that, 20 years down your career, you say academics make this difference to you, and you spend too much on academics. You have something to say about that approach. So I didn't ha I didn't see a question in there. 20 years, yeah, the question. I mean, how would you react to such a possibility? I mean, don't we value student self evaluation more and learn from that and bring it into our course objective? So, there were, there are several things that you said in there. So, sometimes faculty say, I am not really interested in what my students are going to do at the end of the course. I'm really interested in what they're going to do like 20 years from now. Oh. You know, it, it strikes me as, arrogant, that faculty members would even speculate on what fac students are going to do 20 years from now with what we've taught them. We don't have this, I mean, that's a very long trajectory. And somehow, well, what I teach now is not, they're not going to recognize the value of it now, but in 20 years, really? Especially given the rate at which things are changing, how would we know what the, in 20 years is going to be valuable for the students? So the second problem with the 20 year kind of phrase is that, okay, I'm going to teach it to you now, and in 20 years it's going to be valuable. In 21 years, I'm going to check back with you to figure out whether it was valuable, and then I'm going to use that information to revise the course. So it's 22 years before I can change the course. So the time delay is, you know, I've got to focus on the students I have sitting in front of me, and I've got to focus on the things that they're going to give me in the context of the course that I'm teaching, and try to focus on what they are able to achieve in the course, and not think about, I think, what they're going to be doing with it in 20 years as a way to justify what I'm teaching. Yes, sir. It also uh, should also enable students to become selfless, motivated, get inspired. Uh, so, why do these learning outcomes, fine tuning them, revising them, addressing them, practicing them, enable that? Yes. If 
you've chosen the right learning outcome. So for example, let's take your residence time distribution. If you say I want them to be able to design with residence time distribution, does that enable self does that enable lifelong learning or ongoing learning? No. If you want an if you want learning that actually enables ongoing learning and so forth, then you have to write a learning outcome or one or more learning outcomes that focuses on that aspect of it. And then be prepared to offer learning activities that develop that kind of learning outcome. That's one of the reasons that we have this. I find that when most faculty write learning outcomes, they use a very restricted set of verbs. And because they use a very restricted set of verbs, when they write the learning outcomes, they go, well, that's not what I'm after. Well, okay, then write the ones that you're after. Well, I'm not sure how to do that. And that's why when we come back, because we were breaking at an hour and a half, we started at nine o'clock. They didn't let me start until a little while later, so my kind of timing is a little off on this. Um, but that's why we're going to look at a taxonomy of learning outcomes when we come back at uh, 11 o'clock. I'm sorry, we're gonna, you know, you had a 30, you had a 30 second break, so we're gonna, we're gonna break at 11. <laughs> we're gonna get into learning taxonomies. Now, there are several different learning taxonomies out there. We're gonna focus on one. Our, and people will often sometimes ask, are there other learning uh, taxonomies? The answer is yes. Are we gonna cover all the learning taxonomies? No, we're gonna look at one in pretty much depth. And uh, that should equip you to be able to look at others. Uh, we're going to look at actually what's called Bloom's taxonomy, which was originally done in 1950. Uh, Benjamin Bloom and some other people worked on it. I don't know how the other people felt, but the only name that is associated with it is his. Uh, another group of people looked back at it, and they published a revised Bloom's taxonomy in 2001. Bloom's taxonomy provides a way to organize different expectations with respect to learning into some categories. Uh, and first of all, he has ways to organize them into six different levels. And as I, we mentioned earlier with the singular value decomposition thing, there are cognitively different kinds of challenges that you can pose to students. It continues to be one of the most widely used taxonomies, although it's not the only one that's used. But I think it does give you a pretty good picture. The six levels, the second level, this level, gives me particular pause because we just I just went and tried to convince you that we shouldn't use the verb understand, and yet they have a level labeled understanding. But it never uses the verb understand. Okay, these are the six levels. You can see that creating, partly, is the creating level. That's where you get design and invent and those kinds of things. Evaluating, there are cognitively different challenges. Now, I'm going to say something to, that usually manages to aggravate several faculty members. This is not a hierarchical model or a longitudinal model. It does not say that I need to work on this level first, and then this level second, and then this level third, and this level fourth. That is, I one is not a prerequisite for the other. It's not a developmental model. Students' learning does not happen in a nice sequential start here and work your way up, although we tend to construct curricular like that. Learning doesn't happen that way. If I want first-year students to design things, I can give them a design challenge and they can work at that level. Okay, it's not a developmental model. There are cognitively different challenges and oftentimes things at this level, this are cognitively more complex, but they're not necessarily better. This level is not better than this level, but it's different. So, these are some of the verbs. Note at the understanding level, we don't see the word understand at any of the verbs. But these are the kind of verbs that are characterize, that characterize this level thing. I classify them, I explain them, I discuss it, I give examples, I summarize, that kind of thing. 
That's at that level. Now, the advantage of this kind of Bloom's taxonomy is that once I introduce these levels, I'm able to generate, you know, like five or six verbs per level. And now with six levels, I've now up to close to 40 verbs. And now I've given faculty a lot more verbs that they can consider in terms of what are the kind of things that I'm going to ask my students to do. I would also say that once you get this idea of level, some faculty members feel the obligation to be complete. Okay, So now I'm going to do all of these levels, and I'm going to do them for all of my topics. So if I have something on the order of 100 topics, and I have all of these levels, then I'm going to get about at least 600 different learning outcomes. Well, that doesn't work. And that, and you go, well, I have to make, then you have to make choices. Which are the learning outcomes you're going to work on? Well, I could work on some of these and not some of these. Okay. Which are the ones you're going to work on? This is just another diagram with different, same levels, different verbs. Some of them overlap just to give you some more choices. Typically, in terms of the language, the analyzing, evaluating, and creating level, are referred to as higher order levels, so not suggesting that they're better, they're just cognitively different. The analyzing level poses a problem for engineers and scientists. It Analyzing, and this was constructed by psychologists generally, for physicists, chemists, physical scientists, mathematicians, analyzing means something different. It means generating some numbers for a system. Analyzing in their thing has nothing to do with the kind of analysis we do in engineering and or math physical sciences. It has to do with organizing. How do you take the different pieces that you've got and how do you place them in relationship to each other? That's the analyzing level. The analyzing level has very little to do with computing numbers. That's typically at the understanding or the applying level. When you're generating, or this is generating organizations. You can see that I'm breaking information into parts, I'm comparing, I'm organizing, I'm constructing maps where I show the different pieces and how they're related to each other. That, from my point of view, the better verb to use or the better characteristic thing to use here would be organizing. But that's not, I didn't, they didn't ask me when they put it together, but that, but, for scientists and engineers, the word, the way they're using the word analyzing is not the way we typically use it in engineering or physical science. Now, the revised Bloom taxonomy actually recognized that knowledge describing what we want out of students is more complicated than just six different levels. There are, in fact, different things that we deal with. We deal with facts. We deal with concepts. We deal with procedures, and we deal with the metacognitive level. For the question on lifelong learning, or, you know, when learning to learn, that's the metacognitive level. But most, and you go, should we work on that? My answer would be, in most cases, yes. Do we write learning outcomes at the metacognitive level? Typically, no. Do we give learning exercises that are designed to develop those, these kind of learning outcomes? Typically, no. So we're not working on learning to learn, but that's because we don't write the learning outcomes that express this kind of inherent desire. Now, for engineering faculty, when I've taught to engineering faculty, engineering faculty are often fond of the fact that we teach concepts. Great. We teach concepts. Good. They put this to work uh, for, I think it was three or four, I think three uh, universities in Australia put this to the test. There were a group of mechanical engineers and they said, we teach concepts. Let's look at the exams that we give in our mechanics course at three different universities. Let's examine the exams we give and let's see what we actually test. What they found was that a very large percentage of it, well over 80%, tested either facts or procedures. They never tested concepts. So despite the repeated thing that we teach concepts, they never tested them. So if you didn't test them, you probably didn't develop them. Even though we say that we are. So 
your learning outcomes then can talk about the kind of focus that you have. Are you interested in facts, concepts, procedures, or metacognitive? All of these are very valuable educational outcomes. The problem for faculty is not a dearth of educational outcomes, it's selecting from a plethora of educational outcomes. If I go back to your singular value decomposition, if I take that one topic, there could be facts associated with singular value decomposition, there could be concepts, there could be procedures, there could be metacognitive things. I could write for the singular value decomposition at least 24 different learning outcomes that would display these kinds of things. And as we've talked about, we're probably not going to get to all 24 learning outcomes in that course. So what are we going to work on? We have to make some very serious choices. Yes? Metacognitive at one level is the kind of thing that you would work on so that students get better at learning to learn. Self-learning kinds of things. Um, the the best word that I the best short phrase that I know of is metacognitive is thinking about thinking. Now, that may strike you as odd. So we're going to hit this tomorrow afternoon. But I'm going to hint at this. Okay. So faculty member was teaching a calculus course. And as part of the test on the calculus course, he had this thing to integrate. And he looked at it, and it's a symbolic expression, and they were going to be asked to integrate it. Now, the, when he looked at it, he goes, ah, oh, they're going to have to integrate it. They can integrate it using this method. It'll take them three minutes. Bang, they'll be done. Unfortunately, when he gave the exam, he noticed this was the first problem on the test. He noticed that several students were still working on the first problem after 10, you know, 10 minutes into the thing. And he goes, that's not good. Should have three minutes. And I mean, you know, dot. Takes me three minutes to do it. I double it or triple it. It nine minutes is kind of the ultimate. And they're still working on it after ten minutes. What the faculty member didn't quite think about, although he knew it, was that that particular expression could be integrated using several different kinds of integrational methods. Some of them took much less time and required much less computation than others. So if I'm a student and I'm looking at this, metacognitively, I start realizing, oh, there's several ways to integrate this. Which of those is going to take more time and which is going to take less time? Metacognitively, that would be the question. The content of the thing would be, I'm just going to integrate it. But when I begin to think about it, I go, wait a minute, I can approach this several different ways. And now that I realize I can approach it several different ways, I'm going to have to think about how what's involved in each of the different ways, and which way am I going to approach it. So all of that kind of strategizing and planning and so forth is all metacognitive work. Does that help? So, metacog so oftentimes we expect our students to be very skilled metacognitively in their, fir in their first year as students. And they're not. And yet we teach as if they are. And further, we rarely tell they teach to develop their metacognitive skills. Yes, sir. Oh, no. 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 Definitely not. Neither this way nor that way. Neither this way. This is not, across the columns, it's not developmental, and certainly not across the, around, between the rows, it's not developmental. Inferior in what sense? So let's, I mean, so inferior, so I'm going to, can you do anything without facts? No. Should you know some facts? Yeah. So if I say I'm only going to work on the metacognitive level, you're going to learn no facts, well then what are we going to work with? 
as, as some, as there was a, f a president of a university in America that said, you know, I want my students to be thinking. I want to develop thinking skills, but at some level, they have to be thinking about something. So what's the something they're going to be thinking about? I have to work with that as well. No, it's actually not more difficult. It's just a question of where you're going to invest effort. And that that's the real effort, is that... I got a number of places where I can invest effort. Where am I going to make those choices for investment? Because I can't do them all. Uh, she, had, you've had a question already, so she gets. So especially the previous uh, set of levels. This. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that while they're not the development hierarchy, the levels on the top subsume the doing of the lower levels? Would that be a no. no. To apply something, I need to know the, I need to be able to remember the equations. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> no. That's one interpretation that's, uh, that could be your interpretation, but that gen so I can give apply problems to students. Right. And then go work on them. Right, but from the student's perspective, mm -hmm. for them to be able to do the apply level task. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to do some remem related remember level tasks. No. No, they can say, I need to know, what is my phrase here, residence time distribution? I go, I need, I need to apply residence time distribution. I'll go out and find out what it is and put it to work. I don't necessarily need to master the lower levels on residence time distribution to try to apply. I agree, it's not a development program, but I can can I work on any design level task without the without having achieved some related I can give an example. In uh, finding machine learning, a lot of my students can apply a support by the machine they don't understand. So I mean let, I mean can we do the design level? Yes. Okay. You know, if I if I say to a student, I want here's a piece of paper. I want you to construct a paper airplane and launch it. Can I ask them to do that? Yes. Do they have to know all of the principles of aerodynamics in order to do that? No. Would a knowledge of the principles of aerodynamics help them to refine their designs and so forth? Yes. But we can often challenge our students to do the kind of things up here before they have a complete kind of picture here. Okay. And it's the complete kind of picture here. Too often we want them to do everything here before we do this. And, you know, perfection down here doesn't guarantee ability up here at all. You can be really good at these things and you can do really poorly up here. Particularly if you've never tried to do up here. No. So sometimes we organize our classes, we'll do everything down here and everything down here and everything down here, and then lo and behold, when our students get out, they have to do this, and they go, well, I've never done that. Okay. I, give, I, do this for, I give this uh, kind of picture to freshman classes, and I encourage all first-year students to get some sort of exposure to this, and I say, okay, now that you have some picture of these different cognitive levels, when you graduate, what will you get paid to do? I've never had a class that says they get paid to do this stuff. I'll get to that. I have had classes who immediately go, I'm going to get paid to do this stuff. And then I immediately say, well, okay, so on all of your pre-college work, what have you been working on? I've been working on this stuff. And light begins to dawn and say, oh, I'm going to be asked to do different kinds of stuff. And he has a question, and then you have a question. Yes? I, you know, in the beginning, what I did was I just wrote out the, the, the problems that I had recognized with the classes that I've taught. Uh -huh. And I, I just want to state a couple of them just to see what, you know, what, what this question was. Uh, motivation was already mentioned, and there are two more that I have written down. One of them is language access. Um, which in a place like India with the diversity of languages often comes up. And the other is maths apparently. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I'm trying to understand is the in the in the in the in the 
table that's especially the one that you presented in the next slide here. Now, when I'm trying to do you know curriculum design and you know, the first thing that I notice when I, I teach the introductory quantum mechanics course to master students is that I, I we have students who don't know how to take the length of the metric. Mm -hmm. So you know, so this is you know, this is where the problem so I'm trying to organize my thoughts as to how I would take that set of information that I have. Kids who don't understand English very well, and kids who can't take the lesson vectors very well, math preparedness, language access, and combine that with this this kind of a kind of understanding with you. Know, I think it's very helpful to organize. But could you point at you know the questions that you had about the so so then I'll come to question here. So learning outcomes are a description of where you want the students to be at the end of the course. So I have another term that I can tell you is not widely used. In fact, I think I'm the only person that uses it. And that's called learning incomes. Okay. So given your course, what are your expectations about what the students should be able to do coming into the course? Most of the time, those are not ex made explicit either. And usually, I think it would be helpful if you made it explicit to the students, look, I've designed the course assuming that you can do this set of things coming into the course. Now, when you've got a course and you've got a set of students in front of you, you can't affect whether they can do the learning incomes, but you can at least make it clear to both you and the students that this is where, this is kind of the base level. And if you aren't at the base level, then you and I are going to have to work out a separate plan that's independent of getting us here, because we're assuming that we're starting at this point. Now, institutionally, we have a different question. If in our courses, we got a bunch of, we got a set of learning incomes and we make it explicit and we can actually design a test and we can look at the learning incomes for our very, large enrollment, you know, required courses, and we've got 30% of our students that don't meet the learning incomes, then we have an institutional question. Single instructors are not able to resolve that, but if we've got a bunch of students that don't meet these learning incomes, then we got to seriously look and say, can we construct an alternate path for our students? Because if they don't have the learning incomes coming into the course, more than likely, they're not going to be successful, not because of our teaching, not because of their motivation, not because of their commitment to learn, not because of their ability to learn, but simply they didn't start out at a good point. Okay. Second, I will come to this question of motivation. Many faculty talk and say, Motivate, motiv they treat motivation like it's the key to all success. If our students were motivated, all things would come to pass. <laughs> well, I'm going to suggest to you that we can come up with some hyperbole that says that's not true. We're in the year 2018. I think the next Olympics is in 2020. Suppose that you are very highly motivated to win the gold medal in the marathon in 2020. I'm going to suggest to you that no matter how motivated you are, you ain't going to get there. Because it has a lot to do with where you're starting it from and what you've got to limit. So first, motivation is not the key to everything. Second, motivation is a decision. It is not something that kind of sits around and transfers, and it's not one of these kind of qualities that moves around and thing. It's a decision. A student makes a decision about whether they're motivated or not. Most people do not point this out to the student, but they actually make decisions about how highly motivated they are. You do not make that decision for the students. They make that decision. It would be good to raise that question with them, but you can influence the motivation of the student. Most of our influence on motivation should be concentrated on I intrinsic motivation, not extrinsic motivation. But we typically only resort to extrinsic motivation, and we wonder why we're not successful, because we're working on the wrong thing. His question. Okay. Uh, something became very clear to me. 
because of last two slides. Thank you. Basically, I have been trying to initiate in the beginning of the class uh, a, 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 a topic or a concern which, which I consider at my level slightly more complex to recognize. And I try to make students talk to each other and make small groups and discuss and come back uh, in the form of some kind of evaluating exercise or analyzing or in other words, organizing exercise. And, and I, I recognize at the end of the exercise that I have not done a deep enough job, neither students have really taken away something brilliant or fantastic. But after having that, I go to the other things such as understanding or applying. And then when I go back, again, go back to the other thing like evaluating and organizing, second time round, I do much better and much deeper and more, more comprehensive job. And I see the, 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 the joy of learning mm -hmm. in the eyes of my students when I do that. So basically, I have been doing that. But I did not know why it was working. Now I know a little bit why it is working. Okay. The second takeaway for me is that there are four levels factual, conceptual, procedural, and metacognitive. Uh, somebody stole the question from my uh, lips that what is metacognitive? And you explained. Uh, you you should apologize to him. <laughs> <laughs> and and up to some extent, you did explain to that. Still, it is not clear, but hopefully. Oh, we're going to work on it. We have, yes. you know, that's so tomorrow afternoon. Clear. But I did not recognize in my mind. That at all levels, starting from creating, I mean, starting from remembering, understanding to creating, these all four levels apply, which I did not know. If you ask me before telling this, I would have said some of these, like conceptual or metacognitive, probably apply more at other levels, such as, you know, creating and evaluating and other at fundamental level, probably doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I stand wrong on that and uh, something new that I have on plan for me. Yeah. Let's suppose that we could look at this. We could say, so suppose the task were to remember facts. I've got a set of, you know, if nothing else, suppose I have a list of a hundred words and I want to remember them. So that that would be remember a set of a hundred words. But metacognitively, I could then say, well, what kind of strategies would I use to help me remember a hundred words as quickly as possible? There, the end, you know, there's a lot on, you know, if you want to remember stuff, there's a lot metacognitively that you can use that will make this job a whole lot easier. Typically, though, we never help the student understand what metacognitively can, they can do to make this job easier. Your question. I don't know. So, I mean, it depends. So, one, one first of all, I'd say, for a class that you're teaching, is there another, is that it a prerequisite for another class? If that's case, then I want to set my learning outcomes so I get the student ready for this subsequent class. You know, if I'm not getting them ready, then somehow I'm not meeting the obligation that's inherent in the catalog that I will get the students ready. Now, getting the students ready for the next course rarely consumes an entire course. These people do not expect everything from this course. They expect certain things. I should know what those things are in terms of what are the learning incomes for this course and I should those should be part of the learning outcomes for my course. So one of the questions would be, is my course a prerequisite for subsequent things? And if so, what are the learning incomes for the subsequent courses? Second, I need to think about this question of number of learning outcomes versus the kind of depth of kind of thing that I'm thinking of. Um, this is one of the reasons that I'm somewhat skeptical about survey courses. Survey courses kind of said, well, we're going to give you this, you know, we're going to give you lots of stuff. Survey courses are often all about all of the content we're going to convey, survey courses are rarely about what you're going to walk away with in terms of any clarity. And so I think one of the challenges in survey courses is to realize I can only get so many learning outcomes. I have to pick pretty carefully. And as a result, I may not do everything that's, you know, I may not do all of the topics simply because I just can't get it all done and make a good course out of it. You know, we're going to have to be a little more explicit with our uh, fellow faculty members about what we can accomplish and what we can't. Yes, sir. So, it was 
I don't think the word inspire helps because I don't think it tells you what you can do. Um, for people interested in intrinsic motivation, as an introduction, I would encourage you to, to do a 20 minute TED talk. Done by, you would Google TED talk, Daniel Pink, motivation. It's not the end all or whatever, but it gives you a different kind of tack on motivation than you're maybe used to thinking about. But, Let's look at the tool in there. He lays out, you have three tools available to, for you to work on intrinsic motivation. One, you can, it is all other things being equal, which they never are. It is more likely to motiv intrinsically motivate a student if you give them autonomy than not. If they have choice or not. So, one thing is that you can work on autonomy. Two, you can work on mastery. Are you arranging the course so that you give help the students understand the extent to which they are getting better or not? When students see themselves getting better, they that generally helps them to in, in get more motivated. But they have to see themselves getting better. If they see themselves getting worse, I can tell you that ends up in the other end. So you have to think about the course and the way that you're going to provide feedback to students so that it is likely so that most students would see themselves getting better and then that will tend to encourage their motivation, intrinsic motivation. So the second tool that you have is mastery. The third tool that you have is purpose. For a number of us, we teach in a particular discipline, whether physics or mechanical engineering or chemistry or what. And I can tell you that you can look at the career paths of your students. And whatever course you're teaching in, whatever subject you're teaching in, whatever their major is, most likely the students are not going to end up there. And yet we teach as if the only thing that's worthwhile in the world is let's say mechanical engineering. If you're not, if I teach mechanical engineering and if you're not interested in mechanical engineering, then you are the world's worst loser that ever existed. And then we wonder why our students are not motivated. Oh, okay. Remember that our students are, you take an education, students get an education so that they will have choices after graduation. And their choice is not to become whatever their major is. I'll get to the question in just a minute there. And so the last thing, that tool that you have is purpose. What is the purpose of the course in terms of something that for a variety of choices that the students might make after graduation, why should they care about the material that they're learning? What is the purpose of that? Most of the time we do not help our students with clarity about the purpose of our content with respect to the multitude of choices they could make after graduation. It is past 11 o'clock. We're supposed to now end at 11 o'clock, right? I'm sorry for the mistake earlier. We will take a break and we will resume at 30 minutes. And if you have a question, please come talk to me there. We'll leave that up there and we'll see you at 1130.